What's going on everyone, Lullet here. Over the years, I've read a lot of books, and definitely some of your finance, personal finance types of books as well. But more than just being a good read or a pleasant read, some of these books have changed my life in such a way that I wouldn't be able to stand right here in front of you as I am right now without them. Today, I wanna share with you five books that changed my financial life, literally for life, because once you have these takeaways or lessons, you basically know them forever and ever and ever, and more importantly, you can actually share them with those you know, whether that's friends and family, and more importantly, more than yourself, you can actually pass on these lessons learned to the future kin, future generation, your future lineage, etc. And how we're gonna do this is essentially go book by book and kind of give a high level overview without any spoilers, and more importantly, kind of give you the background of where I was in my financial journey for you to kind of consider that into the context as well. And finally go over kind of the takeaways slash lessons I got from these books and really what they mean to me overall and how they've changed my life as a whole. Starting us off, we got a classic, but it's gonna be Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It was the first book I ever read in my life regarding kind of personal finance type of matters. I was around 16 or 17, around that range. But once I read it, kind of changed my outlook on so much, but I also didn't know as much as I do now today. And so over the years, I've definitely reread this book over time, kind of taking away different principles at each and every given time. A couple of bullets to talk through the story of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's essentially two figures, Poor Dad and Rich Dad. The Poor Dad's background, it's more academically focused, more going through the system, going through societal traditional expectations and path, and essentially going to college, getting that job, and having benefits, a salary, and kind of that fixed type of positioning and safe overall. The Rich Dad, on the other hand, is a business tycoon where he has deals in real estate, investments, where he's making money without actually spending his time on said tasks to earn X amount of money. The entire book focuses on this premise of comparing the individual lives of your poor dad and rich dad from a money flow perspective. And so more than just comparing how saving and budgeting works maybe for the poor dad or the rich dad, it also digs a level deeper when you're considering other factors such as business, taxes, being employed, self-employed, etc. I took away a couple things in reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and one of the things I took away was essentially how many years of experience and life you can fit into a book, because from that book, I took away kind of what could be the future. And I say this because I was on a path basically just thinking one line, okay, active income equals making money and education means making money and understanding really at that time that there was really only one path. You can make money in so many ways out there. It's not just one path, one way to make money, one sole source of income that's needed, AKA a job. And there's other ways as well, which brings me to a second lesson I learned from this book. And it was the first time in my life I had heard of something called passive income. When I first heard about passive income, it didn't really mean anything to me. I was like, oh, okay, this is some scam or something like this. But really all I knew at the time was nothing other than knowing that you can earn money actively. So with that, I didn't get the next lesson the first time I read the book, or probably even the second if I'm being honest. But overall, it's basically the power of businesses and taxes. It looks like a simple graphic, but I'm gonna put it up on screen. And it's basically the employee, self-employed, business and investor, and some high level detail. But this type of information, it was, it's so simple. It, when you think about it, when you know everything, it's simple. But when you don't know, you just don't know. So when it comes to taxes, investing, kind of what that means after the fact, before the fact, what are all your options on making money and just ways, AKA your sources of income and so much more. So I'm totally so much gratitude for this book. And if you haven't read it by now, I'm surprised, but it's a good thing because hopefully it changes your life as well. Moving on to our second book. I'm gonna start off like this because I literally say this to people in real life when we meet regarding income in certain situations. So here it goes. What if I told you you could have $41,000 a month without doing anything? And usually people say yes. And so from there, I go on to say, okay, that sounds good. So $41,000, you know, it depends how on tax and structuring and kind of certain way, but is it a fair assumption that that $41,000, it's kind of like $30,000 a month kind of post-tax? And everyone usually kind of agrees from there. And I say, so 30K a month, how much is that? It's basically $1,000 a day. So how does it sound to you if I said you can get $1,000 a day post-tax for life. And then I go on to ask, what about forever? The lesson I learned from this book, the biggest lesson, the book, it's called The Million Dollar Fast Lane. And essentially, I learned about this concept when I was earlier in my journey, you can still consider me more of a beginner, kind of just learning about how everything works and how it all comes together. 
And the main reason being that when I learned about passive income from Rich Dad Poor Dad, this was the first time I actually heard numbers into how it actually functions. The equation for how to get $1,000 a day, that math, it's essentially $41,000 a month pre-tax, just straight up. 41,000 times 12 is roughly half a million dollars. And the math to get this 500K a year without doing anything is essentially having $10 million and then earning 5% in dividend or interest or however, but basically 5% of 10 million is where that 500K a year by doing quote unquote nothing is coming from. The book itself is a beautiful book. It's kind of lengthy if I'm being honest. I listened to it as an audiobook. It kind of felt like he was just dragging it on to be very frank with you, to not waste your time. But essentially MJ DeMarco, he's the author of the book. He basically had limos.com as a domain name and he sold it for X amount in terms of a lump sum and his life went on. So the point of this whole story, how he explains it, is that there's three types of folks. You have your sidewalkers, your slow laners, and then your fast lane. So at the highest level, your sidewalkers are gonna be your poorly disciplined in terms of financial type of per people. And what this means is if you're on the sidewalk, you're essentially more in poverty or when you get cash, you basically are just spending it, you're not saving it, you're not investing it, you're not really looking ahead and it has that YOLO in the negative connotation mentality of just, you know, just spend, it's okay, there's another day, I'll win the lottery, that type of mentality. Your slow laners are gonna be those kind of traditional job holders where you're basically working a corporate America job, Fortune 500 type of job, where you're saving, you're investing, but more in your 401ks, IRAs, or otherwise. And traditionally speaking, you're gonna retire at 65, have hopefully a million plus in your account to last you in your retirement days from then on. But essentially it's a slow lane because you will amass wealth, but slower than compared to the fast lane. The fast lane, on the other hand, is essentially saying that, hey, why don't you just earn all this money up front and then from money make more money to sustain a certain type of lifestyle? Now, how this happens is essentially how it's quoted, how he's done it, is essentially making a business and then from that business, selling off the business, having some capital coming in and then using that capital accordingly. The biggest lesson I took away apart from the 41K a month example is essentially that you can actually combine these lanes. Now, I'm not looking to combine the sidewalkers and the slow lane, but I can definitely see value in combining the slow lane, say for example, and the fast lane, where maybe you do have a traditional job, but you can also have catalysts along the way and actually increase your net worth or your wealth or just cash coming in in general, all to make that kind of portfolio or net worth in general rise, maybe not as fast as the fast lane, let's say, or definitely not as slow as the slow lane, kind of somewhere in the middle, and depending how you kind of structure it, go over it, you can kind of create whatever you want because money is there to be made. It's not like it's not. So next up, we got the book, How Rich People Think, right over here. This is one of the more recent books I've read, and it's a super short read. It took me an hour or less, and you could probably do it even faster. And how it's positioned is each and every chapter is a lesson or takeaway in itself. And they go into further detail into each and every chapter accordingly per that main lesson. And how it's structured is essentially how the rich think versus how the middle class think. I would recommend this book to anyone trying to change their financial mindset into maybe you have some financial toxic habits that you're trying to fix. Or maybe you're just trying to get a different perspective on, hey, how do the rich think if you consider yourself maybe not in that echelon just yet. The lessons I've learned from this book, and I'll come to occasionally just kind of flip through the table of contents just to reread them once in a while, just casually. I'm gonna go out and read a few, so enjoy them. Middle class focuses on savings. World class focuses on earning. Middle class thinks about money in linear terms. World class thinks about money in non-linear terms. Middle class believes hard work creates wealth. World class believes leverage creates wealth. Middle class believes money is complicated. World class believes money is simple. Middle class believes money is about status. World class believes money is about freedom. Middle class believes the more money you earn, the more stress you experience. World class believes the more money you earn, the less stress you experience. Middle class believes money is negative. World class believes money is positive. Middle class embraces advanced degrees. World class embraces any form of education that makes them wealthier. Middle class worries about running out of money. World class thinks about how to make more money. Middle class thinks about spending. World class thinks about investing. Middle class is waiting to be rescued from financial mediocrity. World class knows no one is coming to the rescue. Middle class believes money is their enemy. World class believes money is their friend. There's 30 chapters overall, didn't wanna read them all, but overall for the investment in time in terms of ROI, return on investment, for one hour or sub one hour, you're basically getting that value in terms of those lessons if you didn't know them already. 
and those lessons are going to stay for life. So highly recommend this book. Next up, we got a book by Mark Manson. If you know this book, it's a subtle art of not giving up. I've read this book a couple times in my life. And the first time I read it, I literally was like, this guy, Mark, the author, he's speaking my language. He understands me because everything he was saying about just not giving up, it was basically my life because I was so laser focused at the time. I was definitely younger and it was just this bubble that I surrounded myself with, with my goal, my target, and just everything that I'm going to do. And I don't give up. Fast forward a few years and life kind of happened. I basically reread this book and I was like, man, I'm giving too many. And I was like, okay, let's change this. The title probably gives you kind of the context of what the book's about, but it's all about not giving up where it's not deserved. Because basically if you're not giving up, then all that matters is basically focus on what you need to do, what you want to do. And most importantly, really it's give a about what you really want to do and just the noise. The biggest takeaway from the subtle art of not giving up and basically making money is essentially that I looked at it like this money, it's black and white, checks and balances. It's pretty logical in terms of taking a certain amount of risk. For example, if you're going to get 8% returns on the S&P 500, and that may come with X amount of risk, whatever that risk is, we know it has gone up in the long term over the last hundred years. But on the flip side, if you have some other type of speculative investment, hey, it can go 50% next month or next year. But at the same time, you could also lose X amount at the same time. Essentially, you have some reward and you have some level of risk. And from a mathematical perspective and numerical perspective, everything is pretty much black and white. It's super logical. And so this book tries to give you that, hey, when you take out the emotion from any type of decision, what does the logic speak to? It's helped me become a better investor. It's also helped me just make more money in general because I can have certain habits and disciplines that allow me in my normal life to impact my financial life. And in my opinion, they really are two and the same. And two lessons I really digested after reading this book was essentially that if someone says, you know, man, I don't give a about something, chances are if they really don't, they're basically giving a about giving a So when you think about that, it's kind of that paradox where Everyone really cares. That's pretty much what that means. But where you choose to position it is up to you. And the final lesson of the subtle art of not giving a is that nobody actually gives more of a than yourself. Next up, we got the four hour work week. When I first saw this title, I'm not going to lie. I really thought like, man, what is this clickbait? I don't know if I want to read this. It's literally just a book and a title, but there's so many people recommending that I read this. I was like, okay, Let's take a shot. Why not? Let's see well, what's the worst that could happen. When I first read this book, I didn't have a lot of business context of how the world works in terms of how many different ways you can actually make money, whether online or physical, and how basically the management of that business is where you're really spending a lot of time in that kind of be your own boss, self-employed type of situation. But really, the book explains how you can have a four hour work week where you're not a slave to your business. And essentially, when you systemize your processes you're doing for your work, basically increasing productivity as a whole, for example, implementing certain actions such as time blocking certain times where you do certain activities only, where maybe you're checking email at a certain time given only, and maybe having a virtual assistant who can actually filter through all types of email and only pass on what's really the most important. The book does a really good job at living up to its title because it goes into certain elements and processes of how to optimize certain situations, how to make them more efficient, and basically giving a real life example of how Tim Ferriss has his four hour work week. And if that's one hour for you, or maybe it's 10, the point is it's not more than 10. And really in the end of the day, once you kind of have these systems in place, they're pretty much automated and they keep on going until you change anything that's constant. It was also the first time I heard of the term geo arbitrage. And super quick for anyone that doesn't know, geo, geography, arbitrage is basically in a technical real situation. Let's just say for an example, I'm able to buy Bitcoin, let's say for cheaper in my current platform. And let's say I can sell it somewhere where it's actually more expensive. So arbitrage is essentially allowing me to buy something here and sell it somewhere higher but there's no risk because we're talking about the same security or asset in the situation. In a more relatable example, perhaps, let's just say that the dollar that we earn here in America and then spending that somewhere in Asia, you may have higher purchasing capability. So the geo arbitrage really is going to say, hey, if you're earning in dollars, but then you're going and spending, let's just say in rupees in India, 
then basically you're able to take advantage of the situation just because in terms of what value you can get for $1 here in America versus what $1 equivalent in rupees, approximately 75 rupees if anyone's curious, you'd basically get more value elsewhere. The takeaway here is that earning in dollars is so, so powerful from a financial perspective that if there's 195 countries in the world, and let's just say America and a handful of others are just as powerful from a financial perspective, even if you say 15 of those countries are at that level or higher than America, you still have 195 minus 15 countries, which leaves you with 180 countries that you can potentially geo-arbitrage accordingly. So really, if you're earning in dollars or pounds or euros or depending on what type of currency really has that power, the world is literally your oyster. Further, with the four hour work week, you got time on your hand, so if you have money, assuming the business is going well hopefully, and now you have less time that you're spending on said business, you have money and time taken care of. And when you look at kind of the triangle of life in terms of the three items, such as your money, energy, and time, when you're younger, you may have no money, but you have a lot of energy and you have a lot of time. And if you flip the script to maybe in your older years, you may have less time and you may have less energy, but you may have money. So maybe you're not getting it all at any given time. And so in the middle, yeah, you have some money, you got some time, you got some energy, but net net, if basically money and time are taken care of, then if you fulfill two out of three and they're just check mark, check mark, I mean, there could be a lot more energy that maybe you can gain, maybe you can get back, maybe you can fix that situation accordingly, but it's, it's a powerful principle this four hour work week. <laughs>